So let's move to the fourth major milestone in the phylogeny of play. And that came with the interaction. See, hominids had started by using their hands to throw things. And the hand became psychologically more important. And so they started holding things in their hands, looking at them, and thinking about them. And so, so initially, this was merely to make stone tools. But once they started using their hands, they realized they could do other things with their hands. They just had to think more about it. They could build strange things. They could make fire. They could make clothing. And it all involved the hand, the eye, and the brain working together. And so in the fourth milestone, we see that the balance has shifted very strongly in favor of the cerebral element as opposed to the locomotor element. So let's summarize what these four stages mean. Over the course of phylogenetic time, that is evolutionary time, the locomotor element in our learning has steadily decreased and the cerebral element has steadily increased. Now I'd like to introduce you to this man here, Dr. Ernst Hegel, I probably mispronounced his name, German biologist uh, about 130 years or so ago, and he came up with an idea which I consider to be one of the greatest ideas in scientific history. It is called, or it is a Haeckel's Law, and the law consists of just three words. Ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Now, this would be really great if you knew what the words mean. <laughs> so, phylogeny you already know. That's the evolutionary track uh, of an animal's history. Ontogeny is the developmental path that you take from conception to adulthood. In other words, we start off in, as a fertilized egg, a single-celled creature, which is how life began. And then as we develop, we grow into bigger and bigger things. Did you know at one point, the human fetus has gills like a fish that later disappear? And then at another point, the human fetus has a tail which later disappears. And so the idea is, over the course of time, that fetus becomes, is tracing the development of human, human evolution. The problem is Haeckel's law is wrong. That is, at this point, you don't look like a caveman. You know? And you don't look like a dinosaur or something at another point, or a rat. Uh, there are millions of exceptions to Haeckel's law, but it is good enough as an idea that it still retains some intellectual utility. It's still an interesting idea to keep in mind when you think about evolution and how children grow up and so forth. Indeed, you can see it in the behavioral ontogeny of the human baby. That is, we start off crawling flat on the ground, just like Tiktaalik did. And then over the course of time, we learn to move our forelimbs directly underneath our body until we reach the point where we can crawl like that. Then we start learning bipedal motion. And once we get properly bipedal, we learn new gates. Not just walking, but also running, jumping, trotting, and so forth. Therefore, um, and, and we can see the same thing in the case of the children learning rock play, this was a crucial step in the development of hominids and yet children go through that phase as well. So I'm going to propose a behavioral analog to Haeckel's law. I'm going to say that over the course of ontogenic time, that is, during the development of a single child, that child's initial learning is all locomotor. And over the course of the time, it becomes less and less locomotor. It starts off no cerebral, and over the course of time, it becomes more and more cerebral. So I'm claiming that this is the way we learn. What that means is that this 
is absolutely the wrong way to teach young children because there's no locomotor element at all. They're sitting still. That's not how their brains are meant to learn. They want to run and jump and play and move around and engage in locomotor activity <coughs> because that's what their brains are geared for. This is the wrong way to teach arithmetic. They should not be seeing it on a wall. They should be feeling it in, in their bodies. Here, hold one bucket. It's heavy. Here's another bucket. Now you've got to pour some more water in, uh, as much water into it. Now there's twice as much water. See, it feels twice as heavy. Here's four buckets. You know, here's another example. Uh, take this cart and drag it three meters. Okay, good. Now the next student, take this cart, drag it four meters. How far has the cart traveled? Seven meters. But the thing is, they feel it because they were dragging it with their muscles. The muscles are an important part of the learning of the system of learning used by the human mind. Part of it now, why are we doing this so wrong? Well, you could blame this man, although it wouldn't be quite fair. Rene Descartes, who gave, who greatly addressed the question of what is called the mind-body problem. The basic idea of this actually goes back way, way thousands of years to the beginning of civilization and the idea of law. You see, we have these laws. Don't kill people. Don't steal from them. Should be obvious, okay? And if you do, we're going to kill you. Okay? Now, this is Pretty simple, most people should be able to figure it out, but for some reason, people continue to commit crimes. For thousands and thousands of years, people have committed crimes and been punished for it, and you would wonder, why? How can they be so stupid? Well, Descartes provided one answer to this, the mind-body problem. He says, well, actually, there's our mind over here and our body over there, and our mind is good and rational and virtuous, and our mind knows that we shouldn't kill people and we shouldn't steal from them. But our body is a barbarian. Our body has needs and desires. And it will, it will do all sorts of criminal things unless the mind controls the body. And so you've got to have a strong mind and suppress those bodily urges. And that's the only way that we can be civilized. Well, yeah, maybe so. But that doesn't mean that the body is, the, the fundamental problem is that the body and the mind are not separate. They are very closely joined together. Here's an example from the English language. All of these phrases use a term from the human body to express an idea that has nothing to do with the body. In other words, we are using bodily metaphors to express purely cerebral ideas. The body still profoundly affects the way our mind thinks. Here's another example, probably even less useful. Um, all of the Western or the European languages are descended from an ancient language called Indo-European. And the word for foot in Indo-European is believed to be head, and that basic word shows up in all of these English words. Now, is pessimism really about feet? Uh, you know, it, let me find another one. Uh, do, do, do. A peddler? Well, I suppose you can imagine a peddler is somebody who walks around selling things. But uh, an octopus has eight feet? Well, okay. Pajamas? That really is derived from pet. In other words, <coughs> the body has penetrated our thinking so deeply that it's deeply woven into our language. And I'd like to close today by showing you that even adults allow, uh, even for adults like you, bodily thinking profoundly influences the way you think. Because you see, I'm doing it to you right now. 
There's something inside the brain called mirror neurons. These are organized in big circuits. And the mirror neurons basically allow you to feel something that you see. For example, you're watching a movie and here's a guy with a hammer hammering a nail. Bang, 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 and then he hits his hand. Bang! Oh, ouch! And you might say, ooh, ouch. There are lots of things you see in movies where you feel the physical thing that you see on the screen. That's because there are these mirror neurons that take what you see in the visual world and connect it directly to the locomotor circuits or sensory circuits that feed into your brain. In other words, you're actually feeling it. Uh, another good example of this is the idea of a child watching his father and copying what he's doing. He's watching the motions of his father's hands and he's actually able to translate that into similar motions of his own hands. And we see it over and over again. The human mind is full of mirror neurons. And those mirror neurons are at work inside your brain right now. Because you see, I run around, I jump, I wave my arms, I do all of this stuff. And it's really a very sneaky way for me to get my message across to you without your even knowing I'm doing it. It's kind of like propaganda. <laughs> see, because when I do these things, you, in effect, feel the energy and excitement that I have. And that makes you excited and energetic about it, and it makes you more willing to accept what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, even adults still have a strong connection between their body and their mind when it comes to learning. And so, I, the, the conclusion I draw from all of this is that we, as a culture, need to understand the importance of locomotor aspects of human learning. We should certainly make dramatic changes in the way that we educate very young people. We are already showing developments in that direction with early education. Early education is very well focused on locomotor behavior, but then at some point we put them into school. And at that point, we throw it all away, and everything goes to hell. Thank you very much for your time.